Righto, money miners. Must tell you what, diggers must have had COVID going around or something. <laughs> oh, it can be the only reason I've lost my voice. A bit hoarse, Matthew. We're all a bit hoarse, oh. but what a bloody week. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what at diggers, the only thing I've found to be more reliable than a friggin' Panadol and a late night kebab was Axis Mining Technology. Oh, of that was course. the only thing in life I think it was better than that. Great <laughs> to catch up with bloody Shawnee there. Mate, he was Hard to get a word in. The people going up to Sean having a yarn oh, is bloody crazy. non-stop. Knows a thing or two about drilling, doesn't he? Mate, he's usually on the phone when you give him a ring too. Drill hole survey instrumentation, give Shawnee a ring. Phone number's in the show notes. That's it. Cheers, Axis. Great to see him all there. Mate, um, bit of a digger's recap coming up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what else we got? Digger's recap. There's a few bits of news that we'll chat out. Today, as of course, well. yes, we do. We're still doing news. Yeah, we, we're like we'll talk about our social life to start with. Of course, also <laughs> everything that's going on in in markets, in in metals markets, everything is worth a, mm. a bit of reflection on that. It's been a, a wild sort of ride since we <laughs> did a daily. Last Diggers week. was a bloodbath. Like was. there was some depressed people walking around that lost shitloads of money on paper during oh, the day because the market just got hemorrhaged while we were there. I so I gave somber. someone, everyone talk about oh, every event we're at, like, oh, mate, the futures are down five and a half percent in America. <laughs> Jeez, it's going to be rough tomorrow. <laughs> like, <laughs> JC, you've done a couple of awards up. Oh, mate, we've got some, we've so got some news out of WAF. Bit out of medallion, IGO, uh, IGO, and uh, JD Ar- Arcadium, CZR, Arcadium. Yeah. All right. Let's just get into let's it. Let's just rip in, right, JD? What the bloody hell? Well, this one's a bit of a a bit of a roundtable. Let's just, mm. you know, what what were the big things that stood out to us from diggers? So I think the first one that comes to to mind for me is gold was clearly the standout, and you know, partially because gold's doing quite well, all time mm. highs, and partially because every other metal and, you know, energy-related commodities in, in the doghouse, right? I mean, why don't we just run through a couple of the the various prices for the commodities out there Let's from just a, a few days ago before we left to to now. Some of the standout moves are lithium. You know, this one's obviously a bit a bit murky, but over 900 US bucks for 6% spot, now looking about 850. Mm. So that's, you know, in, in the space of a few days, not a not a good movement. And that's really showing up in a lot of the names, you know, your, your lion towns and so on. Uh, struggling quite a bit. Copper was over four bucks a pound, and now it's you know a good bit under, sort of you know around three bucks ninety. That's come off a long way in in a few months. Iron ore and Brent and you know other sort of oil derivatives are, are really interesting to look at because they're the big drivers. They're the the markets where there's a lot of money and a lot of eyeballs on. So you can see since early July, Brent has come off US ten bucks a barrel. So it's now floating in the in the high kind of seventies. And that's just a, a bit of an indication of all of a sudden everyone's concerned about a recession again, in particular in, in the US, but other parts of the world and Australia sort of cops it on the back of that as well, right? So maybe the, yeah, the consensus was maybe the landing's not going to be soft in mm. America now, but, oh, look, it did. It was a couple of days of blood, but uh, it seemed to sort of repair itself. Yeah. Um, a little bit, yeah. And the, the other thing that really stood out to me was the the PGMs, Platts, Palladium, <clears throat> Now they're a really interesting one because so much of their end use is in in autos in, in you know soaked up by the car makers out there. So to see plats come off fifty bucks an ounce and palladium come off thirty bucks an ounce was really interesting because that ties really in to the whole recession fears people spending less on on cars and all those sorts of things. And you know the the state of that market obviously dominated by South Africa and Russia and a bit in Zimbabwe and stuff and a bit in the states is just not looking so healthy at the moment. Yeah, it was interesting talking to the, you know, a lot of broad range of fundies and and stuff. Like the general consensus was like it's fucking hard to find a good solid long Mm -hmm. at the moment. Like it's a bit bit slim pickings. There's so much doubt across everything that you've just said, JD, and and, and even the Goldies. Like they're all at different – different stages, some of like, you know, in that growth stage, it's like what is a reliable bloody long because they bloody, I don't know, I'm sure there's funds out there that short things. Well, but <laughs> I've never heard of one. <laughs> not, in Australia, not in Australia no. anyway. But, um, but that, it's just that not- was what like, and a lot of, there was a, there was a few stocks getting thrown around that were like, you know, getting the uh, well talked about and like sort of people were leaning towards, but there wasn't some real – High Definitive, conviction yeah. bets well, going I mean, you, around. That's the that's the vibe I got from the gold bar. Yeah, you know, I, I'd agree <laughs> with that. And 
I mean, talking about gold, it's not been massively reflected in the in the earnings yet. You know, it, it should be in time, but we haven't seen knockout earnings on the back of the the all time high gold price, right? Because costs just continue to tick higher and higher. And, and hopefully, you know, as some people have cleaned up their hedge books, some acquisitions have been bedded down. Some of these companies will actually start to show really good earnings, and some of them, you know, if you're looking a year out or two years out, they are perhaps trading on quite enticing multiples, but that's a bit more, you know, looking out the front rather than looking in the rearview mirror. And arguably the flow through to the gold juniors is just continues to be protracted, right? I mean, they're, they're one of the few commodities who's, you know, the price is up and the share prices, a lot of them are going down. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and then it, it just all ties in, right? Because building projects is so hard, you know, the dilution you have to do is just so great that it's just a big negative cycle. Yeah, it was just a bloody, mate, unreal, I'll tell you what, walking down the bloody main street at night, looking at the exchange lit up, the histories, the wide roads from the bloody, all the previous camels that used to walk there, (laughs) just a freaking great week, an unbelievable event. I just had, it's like going to schoolies again, but just, (laughs) and, and like, thanks to bloody everyone that gave us free piss at all different events and um, so I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Tell us, like, uh, We were going to, I think it was a, uh, I think it was one of the one of the broker events um, and one of, one of my mates uh, that isn't involved in the finance industry just uh, walks up to the door and the security goes, uh, do you know whose event this is? He's like, no. Nah. <laughs> Can I come in anyway? And he just stared at him and he's like, no, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but oh, no, it was just awesome. oh mate, it's just it's just such a great week. Oh, just absolutely loved it. No, it was good fun, good hey. Fun. But uh, yeah, I got I got one MD hooked on the vape that I never oh, had. That's quite before. the that achievement. Was, that was a good a achievement win. for me. So <laughs> I think you took a, a different MD's vape home as well. Oh <laughs> yeah, from the gold, event. Mate, there's just so many MD vape interactions. Something for the back wall to put on there. <laughs> Gotta frame that one. Oh, oh no, it's bloody. Uh, and, what, what what stood out for you, Jess? No, so. and it was actually uh, another great crew to see down at Diggers was the Verify crew uh, on the Sunday night at uh, De Banales. They had put on a first event. great event. That was our first event um, on on the calendar. So that was um, thanks to Verify team for having us there. Great function. Awesome to see lots of happy Verify customers in the crowd and lots of new ones coming along as well. Um, they've actually now officially got boots in the ground. New BD manager. Uh, Nathan Kong, he's ex Rio Goldfields Aluka mining engineer. That's the sort of quality you can be expecting from Verify, based right here in Perth. So his LinkedIn is uh, in the show notes. So hit him up for a for a demo or a trial or whatever you like. He, uh, apparently, uh, Nathan said to me that he, he in his engineer days mm. when he was doing some underground time, came and uh, threw bolts. At Agnew for a one Matt Michael on the jumbo. <laughs> and he's like, What, he's what like, was his impression he's of He's like, you? I don't know if you remember, but like, you just kept yelling at me and telling me to hurry up. And bloody said, If I don't want to work harder, I can fuck off and all this. <laughs> and I'm like, Geez, that sounds like me. But uh, oh, <laughs> look, at, so look at how we've both prospered since then. And we got to meet Grant at Verify. Oh, oh we got to meet the Grant. Grant. <laughs> the Grant. And, mate, they reckon that, mate, the AI is popping, going off. Like, Absolutely gone off. There are uh, it's the uptake's been unbelievable. So mate, you better get in quick because she might be starting to get lined up. But yeah. mate, they were uh yeah, thanks thanks for having us. So and a side note, uh, I've definitely I know you boys probably noticed the same, but between the co- few conferences last year to like say diggers uh, this week, so many more verified presos, it's becoming the new norm. Um and it's it's actually quite funny, it's pretty hard work trying to follow a verified preso with like a basic 2D PowerPoint. It looks pretty average now. So <laughs> I mean even you can check out the Spartan one, um you got Lawson spinning around. Gen- Genesis had it too. Genesis uh, had it. The flyover and, and everything. So that was one of the – I did go and watch some presentations to, you know, validate that ticket purchase. So <laughs> oh, good, back, back good ROI, mate. Matthew. Backed up a few. <laughs> I've got one more takeaway from, from Diggers, just from chatting with a bunch of people, and that was sort of related to permitting in Australia. Mm. Yeah. And the, the read-through wasn't so positive. Permitting is really hard. One of the – Examples we spoke about is a company we've spoken about on the show not too long ago, South 32, with what they're trying to obviously do with their their bauxite mines just out of Perth here. But 
that was, you know, one of many examples. There's companies all over that are struggling. It just takes a long time. And the takeaways for me, firstly, are just bullish long-term commodities because that means there is less supply. And this is a big, broad, long-term theme, but, you know, that is just going to set up prices to go higher because there's less supply coming on, obviously. And also you kind of long developing countries there, right? Because it's just not the same hurdle. They're going to get yeah. projects online quicker and those governments will reap the rewards through royalties and so on. So that was just a takeaway from many discussions that I that I had there. I think, and we'll talk about it a bit later, but on on the back of what you said, it sounds like companies would rather truck a bit further mm-hmm. than fuck around building and permitting a processing plant. Like it's just work. like anything with a permit is gold at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so no pun intended. No <laughs> pun intended. Right, eh? What's uh, GC? You've got some. Uh, some awards to give out. We've got some awards. So, <laughs> for those who didn't see last night at the uh, at the gala, the uh, the actual awards. Um, so, Emerald won Digger of the Year, Azua for their deal with SQM, and Hancock won Dealer of the Year, and uh, Emerging Company of the Year was WO One. But so, well done to those companies. Well, congrats. But it's important to recognise some of the under the radar champions of the mining industry <laughs> who are equally deserving of some recognition. So, first award, best merch. It's very hard to go past the Spartan and Top Jewel chariots. <laughs> Here's me um, with one of the Spartans out the front of the Goldfields Centre. I, I think you had a ride on one oh, of them. Oh, mate, I had, a, I had a ride with. Uh... With my mate, but apparently uh, two uh, underground mining folk of mine, Mark Bowden and Mick Garbellini, hopped in <laughs> together and nearly bottomed it out. So I reckon the quads, <laughs> the quads of the rider there would have been the lactic Working acid would hard. have been. <laughs> 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 oh god! And then the other one, which uh, thanks to GC number two who uh, gifted us one of these. This is the. Uh, the dreadnought oh, make exploration yes. great again. That was <laughs> in a bit of a, uh, you know, similar to the MAGA hat, so loved it. Um, and I heard Delta had some big and very good T-shirts around as well, so good at them for not taking themselves gonna, too um, seriously. I think they're going to uh, they're gonna ship us a couple too. They were good. Oh, very good. <laughs> so what else you got, Ali? What's alrighty, next? Alrighty, so Good Samaritan. <laughs> There was a lovely young gentleman in the outdoor area at a gold bar during the week who had completely lost his voice and he was carrying around a um, Diflam throat spray to sort of ease the pain of the sore throat. So it was sort of like one sip of a pipe, one spray of the Diflam a bit. <laughs> and he was kind enough. He was kind enough enough. So anyone want a quick spray? Like, to, to help to help ease the pain of the other delegates. So well it was done, funny, mate. It's funny, funny, talking about throats and uh, smells. Because, uh, uh, you know, I carried, always carried Chewy around with me because she's a long day uh, and you, you don't usually go back home to freshen up for dinner. She's just a, she's a full slog. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, talking to someone at uh, good old Gold Bar, free free plugs for Gold Bar or not, <laughs> um, and had a had a had a piece of chewy in talking to them, and they're like, "I just want to say thank you very much for having chewing gum and considering others, because some of the people I'm talking to, it's like bloody." 10 Alsatians in front of my face. It's <laughs> bloody horrendous. So like you're, I can just say this fresh mint smell coming out of your mouth and I just really appreciate it. No, Not your first hygiene. rodeo, Matty. <laughs> Very good. Not your first rodeo. All right, next award. Best new talent, absolutely hands down, has to be Jay Henderson from oh, Canaccord on was, the vocals at the um, at the Canaccord event. She was sensational. Mate, her, she did Rolling in the Deep by Adele, Adele and oh, loved it. nailed it. It was unbelievable. Paul yeah. Howard doing a bit of U2 yeah, too. Yeah, that mate, was good. Co- and Cookie, Cookie doing the uh, Cold Jimmy Chizzle. Barnes part of When the War is Over. Yeah. Mate, they were unbelievable. So loved uh, it. shout out there. Well yeah, done well. there. One rehearsal apparently. One rehearsal. One rehearsal. Oh, I loved it. Cookie just it. like he bring the gear up. He's like, right, yeah, 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 let's go. So uh, <laughs> love it. Yeah, no, that was absolutely awesome. Now, next one, money and mine team, best on ground. Maddie Michael, I have to say, and this is like but it's like a positive best on ground. No, isn't no, it? Uh, no, very <laughs> positive best on ground. I heard from at least a dozen independent sources. You are like an absolute machine. You're at the conference. You're at networking events. You're at the gold bar. You're just 
everywhere, <laughs> right? And like, <laughs> actually, I heard this story from a few people. They're like, so Ralph Finlayson or Bill Bamett would walk into a room, yeah, mate, how you going? Blah, blah, blah. Then it'd be like 15, 20 minutes later, Maddie Michael comes through the door. <laughs> oh, all these fanboys. Oh, mate, just wanted to say hello. <laughs> Selfies. You like the, the 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 biggest celebrity in Kalgoorlie this week. Like, like, well done, Maddie. Oh, oh bloody! Uh, I don't think Bill got there till. Like bloody Tuesday night. I didn't run later, into him. Yeah. But, um, oh, mate, they're probably glad I've come along. I know. Yeah. No <laughs> just to, to ease anymore. the social pressure. <laughs> oh, mate, it's so good to chat to everyone. Everyone's just like, – there's just 2,000 GCs in the one spot. It's so good. So bloody – oh, it was – Best week of my life, better than school is. <laughs> and also truly grateful for uh, for you boys. Uh, actually, J- Jada, you absolutely get a special mention for driving so I could be a passenger princess. So oh, thank yeah. you very Maddie, much. Maddie was sort of <laughs> phenomenal doing the whole drive there as well. well he, 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 he was preempting bad behaviour, but he, he came up really strong on the way back as well. Yeah, no, I'm bloody, mate. And, oh, this is, oh, the next one's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm still salivating over this. Oh, God. So, no, the last award from uh, the Money of Mine <laughs> Diggers and Dealers Awards was the Good Footy Award, and that absolutely hands down goes to the Tamman Road House Rosie's Fried Chicken. Oh, oh the that, salt on it. The so salt, good. The seasoning. The spices. Oh. The, the, oh. the first four hours of the drive back went surprisingly quickly and the, the last two hours we were starting to pull up a bit. So mm. it came at the perfect time just a couple hours from Perth. Oh, but nothing keeps you more awake than scroll and watch lists and talk and stocks <laughs> between us. That was bloody Good sensation. That's seven hours of chat each way. Oh, mate, I was like, I, I was very conscious of my food intake while I was there. Hook some food into me. Actually converted to vodka, lime and sodas. I've notoriously not been very able sensible. to drink, drink spirits. So I was actually on them instead of the red wine and I've just excelled as a human. I, I didn't. I didn't offend anyone. I don't think. I re- recollect everything. I don't, I don't remember. I was just, I was a, oh, just that was just the bloody best week I've had in ages. Good Absolutely stuff. loved it. Good wrap up. Oh, On to uh, Arcadian good, good stuff, Lithium. Good stuff, Josie. And bloody – Great mate. awards. Was that that, oh, was, yes. that was your first full diggers, wasn't that it? That was my first full diggers. I've previously only done a day trip, but um, first full one and – I loved it, but also I really wanted to go home yesterday as well. So <laughs> when, sit in the fun. sauna. <laughs> when when, when uh, you twenty late twenty year olds get to my age of thirty seven, <laughs> you remember. You remember what I did for the team, and because I'll tell you what, you were having a concerning amount of naps. Oh jeez, <laughs> it was about the three this is o'clock, true. <laughs> the three o'clock siesta in Trav's house. Like, all right, everyone's going to bed. Everyone's going to have a little wine down before the next function. It was great. It was so good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, next up, Arcadium Lithium. All right, uh, let's let's pre- get into it. Previously, um, all chem. Yep. And uh, or, or cobra, or cobra and Galaxy and uh, Livent. 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 Yep. Bloody, yeah. Anyway, uh, Arcadium. There's, there's a whole history there. <laughs> Let's get into a bit of a mining news. So mm. this one came out this morning. They're sort of Q2 given they're predominantly a, a North American company. But it's pretty interesting because obviously we've spoken about a fair bit of pain and suffering in the lithium space of late. Mm. But we've also been talking heaps about production coming online. So Pilbara, Mount Holland, Lion Town, Kathleen Valley, Green Bushes. This is all new slash expanding capacity. So this one's a bit different. They're reducing their capital spending by US five hundred million over the next twenty four months, and that's sort of you know naturally in response to the market conditions, as they say. It's a bit counter to what the others have been doing out there. Mm. Now the previous expectations have been, and these are all US dollars that I'm talking in, were around $1.6 billion in CapEx. So it's still at $1.1 billion over the next 24 months. That's a lot of money to be invested for a company that's capped at under $3 billion US and obviously just far in excess of their actual earnings. So they've got a $500 million revolver up their sleeve still that's, that's undrawn. So we'll see how they go about funding all these projects or perhaps – you know, down the track if there is more cuts to be had because what they're doing is deferring spending on two of the four expansion projects that they had. And the big one is James Bay. Now, Matty, you, you came and said this straight away this morning. It was the, it was the big sort of standout point. It's, mm. a, um, it's now called the Galaxy pose, Project. I posed the question last week, I think, well, like, what's – like, what what's the progress of that? Like, still going through the, the permitting stage? Because that was before the whole lithium – um, mania last year, like James Bay was already sort of proven up, 
I'm pretty sure, and like sort of progressing towards mm. that point. It was sort of the first, the first one in that um, Quebec region. Yeah, so. exactly. So, so now what they're doing is just looking at bringing a strategic partner or yeah. whatever. They they want someone to obviously help fund the thing for them, and obviously they're going to take a bit of the the economics of the project for that, but doesn't bode well. Then you've got Salah Hombre Muerto. Now that was good. Thank you, mate. <laughs> and what they've done here is um, they've resequenced the the work they're doing. So they were going to do a couple projects simultaneously. They're now going to do one, then the other, and obviously that just delays some of the spending down the track a bit. Namaska Lithium, that one's still going ahead, but all up, they're still talking about twenty five percent more hydroxide plus carbonate production for the coming financial year. But they are pulling a bit back on the on the spod side of mm. things. So that kind of leads into to Mount Catlin, which I think is really worth a chat. You know, we've got Ma- uh, Medallion, which we're going to talk about in a moment as well, mm. in that sort of uh, Ravens Ravensthorpe area in kind of close to, to Esperance for those not from Western Australia. And the outlook for a few different operations, nickel operations, lithium operations, hasn't been so good. And there was a quote from the, the boss today essentially saying, with prices in the three digits, not the four digits, care and maintenance becomes a much more acute debate. So it seems like a a matter of time. And again, you know, first and foremost, a lot of people have already lost their job in in WA and this employs 300 people. So it's, it's not a good sign for the the small town there, but hopefully. Especially on the back of first quantum as well. Yeah. Down in Ravo. Yeah. So hopefully Medallion and what we speak about in a moment can potentially pick up a few of those jobs. That's still a bit more down the down the track that's got to be mm. proven up a bit more and permitting and all these sorts of things to go through the motions. So we're going to say some more government support in WAJD, do you reckon? Oh, I think that's the right question to ask because we saw a big Tony O from, from Liontown sort of mm. pleading the case for royalty relief and they, they were talking to what was done sort of four years ago and, you know, this isn't a, a complete free kick. That was paid back is, you know, and that's the line that the whole lithium – market in Australia will push that they need the help now and they're going to pay it back if you can just structure it properly in due course. And I think it just becomes a very political debate in a, a pretty short matter of time. We've got a WA election early next year. We're probably going to have a, a, a nationwide election around the same time, maybe a bit later next year. We've seen the the whole nickel sector in WA, you know, and 7,000 kind of jobs roughly in uh, a year or so. Yeah. So it, it becomes very political about how they go about this. And I, d- I don't know what the the right answer is. I mean, we've kind of said on the show, I'm not generally of the opinion that governments should support these things on end, but whether there is some short-term support that can be provided, is it's a slightly different and it's quite a nuanced debate. Yeah, and... Just to get them over the line. Well, I'm like one person quoted to me the other week and, and it makes sense like government support is supposed to lose money like it's <laughs> that's like when, when you're getting that because you look at you got to end because you got you do have to sympathize with line town like there was this lithium boom they've created a project from scratch gone through the, all the process it's obviously taken a long time and they've finally got there but then the price has shit itself so like it's it's a fr- that's a freaking tough spot to be in. So mm, yep. I I would one hundred percent agree with some short term relief there, just because <laughs> they've gone through the whole, the whole process thing, right? of a green, greenfields operation. Um, so I, I wouldn't agree to it forever. Yeah, but yeah, no no project can <clears throat> last a, a prolonged period with with government support. That doesn't that doesn't end well. Yeah, but maybe maybe in the shorter term, there's there's something to be kind of done there. Yeah, and interesting with lithium, JD, like the fact that you've got, I know this is just hard rock, but you, when you've got Pilbara and Greenbushes expanding and Liontown coming on and the price still decreasing, it just does not give much hope to any other either incumbent or high cost lithium producers um, in the hard rock space, that's for sure. Yeah, and that, that kind of, um, you know, segues me into the next part of the debate People often talk about Arcadium in the context of them being a takeover target. And Rio is the the takeover, you know, giant that sort of sits over the shoulder there in many of those discussions. And, you know, we've seen Jakob Starzom talk regularly about liking lithium being 
disciplined, yada, 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 about how they go about their M&A and all these sorts of things. And f- for the most part, rink on aside, they, they have been pretty disciplined. They sort of mm. bided their time. So we'll see. But I wanted to sling a different name out there because everyone sort of presumes Rio will be the ones that do something sooner or later. And I wanted to kind of put forward whether – Pilbara will do anything and just have a bit of a chat about it because we saw comments just earlier this week, I believe, from from Dow saying lithium would be the the commodity they'd prefer to expand in if they're going to do any sort of M and A, although they would potentially look at other battery metals. And I mean, there, there, there is one point that immediately comes to mind with Arcadium having a couple uh, facilities in China that is probably a strike against any kind of combination taking place, but. If you look at the relative performance of these two companies, Arcadium has been whacked way harder than Pilbara has. I mean, they're down almost twice as much as what Pilbara is over over the last year, roughly. We can just flick up that chart now. So, you know, we, we know they're spending a lot of their cash that's going into expanding Pilgangura, and obviously that is going to be first and foremost their, their priority over the short, medium, and long term, if they can just get down the unit costs there. But- Potentially, we saw them do it four years ago and they did a very timely deal. They got it away. They tied in a capital raise at the time, but maybe they can do a good bit with their with their paper here. I'm not sure they want to dig too deep into their pile of cash. They want to you know, keep a, a good steady buffer during this downturn. But <clears throat> I think that's kind of one to watch. And I know Oz Super have been phenomenal supporters of the company. They've got a phenomenal amount of money that just keeps growing week in, week out, month in, month out. And we've seen them structure deals, you know, and be very supportive of companies in the past. Maybe there's something to be said about that. So just one to watch, I think. Yeah, do you think, <coughs> God, there's some throat clearing going on this episode. <laughs> you need a diff lamp, mate. <coughs> Where's all? Oh, mate, come and, come and give me a good Samaritan? <laughs> Arcadium was notoriously, like, the, it was never like, they were never like, the best assets were they like they seemed to be like that's how they were touted a bit. A lot of their stuff was it wasn't the top fringe of no, quality. And the, and the I mean the the merger with Livent was sort of bringing a, a more of a chemicals business with a with a mining kind of yeah. business together. It's not totally Pilbara's strong suit. I mean, there's a lot of brine assets here, so that would obviously be a check against this kind of making sense. I thought it was just a bit of a a different way of looking at it, considering that everyone kind of talks about them as a a takeover target. Yeah. But I mean, I think, I think on an output basis, they're the third biggest in the world. So there is scale and that would add serious scale yeah. to Pilbara. All these, you know, companies obviously are, are still long-term, very bullish, the the growth in demand for lithium. Well, so, if they are, this is the time because everything is yeah. hammered. It makes way more sense to do a deal now than it did this time last year. Yeah. No, this is definitely Eyes the time to GC. <laughs> Eyes peeled. Eyes peeled. All righty. Let's get into the next one. What do we got? Oh, geez. Woff. Woff. Um, unfortunately, a ding, ding, ding. Yeah, a bit of um, ding, ding, ding for myself on that one. Um, not great news today, JD. No. Stock is down, got about 10% plus or minus. So what's come out here is a, a new mining code. Now, they're going to be replacing, in effect, what, what's been there since 2015, we don't exactly know when it comes in. They said eight days after the publication in the official journal, but we don't know when that publication is. So kind of remains to be seen when it gets embedded through the, the broader market there. Yeah. So, and this, so this, this new mining code for <clears throat> Burkina Faso, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't apply to WAF's San Brado existing, but will most likely apply to Kiaka. Is that the summer? I, I think there's a bit of nuance to it and I, and I don't think any of the companies actually totally know yet either. So there's still a lot of points that are open for interpretation. But there were there were three things that stood out to me, Maddie, and that is the free carried interest is going up from 10% to 15%. That is the you know the, the biggest feature mm. of this new mining code. Not clear to your to your point on Sombrado whether this will be retroactively in, imposed on existing operations. So WAF currently has three subsidiaries in, in the country there, which they are 90% owners of. And then the, the government is on Ten, the other yeah. side of those. So who knows if that is going to go and change. It's not quite uh, totally transparent just yet. The, the second takeaway was that Bikina will reduce the maximum tenure from when they first give the mining permit to a company. 
from 20 years down to 10 years. Now that is not, that's supposedly not applicable to, to WOF. Again, we'll, we'll kind of see. That's how WOF has interpreted that one. And then the third thing is that existing mining permits may reduce to five years. So that could be trimming down all the ones that are out yet, out there. But of course, you then, being the owner of the mine, have the option to renew that on a, a five-year period kind of okay. blocks going forward. So that's kind of what, <clears throat> what's been put forward at the moment. And WAF just came out with essentially a one-pager uh, describing how they've interpreted a few of those features. But I think it actually remains to be seen and it's still a bit of a matter of time before yeah. that is soaked in. Also, I'm sure they'll be doing their uh, good chunk of negotiations and liaising with the government regarding this yeah. going forward. It might be yeah. a flight over to Burkina Faso for a few. I'd say be Heidi would be on the plane right now <laughs> possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, who, who else do you think is sort of the uh, – sort of main impact on as well. Well, well, it's, I mean, there's obviously a, a heap of juniors, actually more TSX listed juniors out there in, in West Africa in general, but at the bigger end of town, you've got Endeavour and I Am Gold. They will be, uh, you know, running the ruler over this. They're a bit more diversified in their operations, unlike WAF. So this means everything to, to WAF, especially with Kiaka in development. But I think the real question is, is this a kind of opportunity for, for all the people out there that are, that are seasoned West African punters and they, um, they understand that mining codes change, you know, unfortunately coups happen or sometimes fortunately coups happen in these places, social unrest does pop up, you know, rather more frequently than perhaps it should. A lot of those sorts of folks look at these things as opportunities and I think, hey, the socks come off. Things are going to stay the same. I know the country's still going to want the tax. They're still going to want the royalties. They're still going to want the earnings from their free carried interest in these operations. I'm just going to go and buy some. And how I'm kind of looking at this after scratching my head for a little while is I, I don't think this is totally one of those opportunities. The economics have, you know, they look like they're going to actually change for WAF. And I think it's quite appropriate this, the stocks come off kind of 10 plus percent because if it does sort of follow through that, the free carried interest jumps from 10% to 15%, then that obviously materially chalks off a bit of the nav for WAF yeah. as a business. So I think that's a quite fair assumption and, you know, just comparing what you valued the project at yesterday with what it is with this new code in place, it might be worth 10 plus percent less given yeah. you're owning a smaller portion of it. So that's where I'm kind of standing at at the moment. But again, who knows what this actually is eventually going to look like. I don't think the country taking the operations off their hand or anything like that is a, a serious concern. The, oh, these guys pay a shitload in, in tax yeah. and all these things. So. Yeah, no, I don't think that's – and it hasn't put them at risk of needing to raise or anything because they've got to front up all the capital anyway for Kiaka because it is a free-carried interest. So it doesn't – probably wouldn't change anything there. It's just future cash flows. Cash flows. Yeah. And, I mean, to, you know, to what's kind of delight, they got a capital raise away last month. They're, they're pretty steady. They've got – uh, almost fully drawn debt facility. Good Ch gold uh, price. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're making a lot of money at, at Sombrado, so th they'll be okay. We'll just sort of see where this goes in in the next few weeks and months. And, gents, while actually we're on the, the topic of gold, uh, we also saw the West Gold Corora merge officially complete last week, so mm. um, congrats <clears throat> to all the teams there. Doesn't it, doesn't it look so easy? Like once it's complete, it's like, oh, Oh, it's done on to the next thing, right? But uh, <laughs> I, I've heard there was some um, clenched sphincters <laughs> during, <laughs> during the process. I can Because I think there was a bit happening behind closed doors. Just a little bit, hey? I don't think our word on the decline was too far off. No. By the sounds. So, bloody good job getting that one through. Yeah. 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 And yeah. if you recall when the deal was initially announced, one of the things we discussed on the potty and then Remelius later called out uh, as part of their takeovers panel application was, some queries around the almost 500 million odd operational and corporate pre-tax synergies, right? And a lot of people thought, you know, including ourselves, that these were, you know, perhaps on the loftier end. But I think now I completely understand one of the main drivers for these synergies, right? So I'm going to cut to an image here. This was me with Marty Law before I knew what a SMEC VSD was, how it worked and the cost savings. <laughs> I look very confused, not really sure what's going on for my very simple uh, commercial brain there. But then after I spoke to Marty Law, 
This is me after. Look oh, at that. look at that. Look how happy I am. Look at just because, like, yeah, the, the piece of the VSD puzzle has been finished for you, Just so. I was just blown away. I actually genuinely was blown away. And so, Pardon the pun. Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so West Gold have a shit ton of SMEC VSDs across their sites and I'm, I reckon they'll probably be uh, building be out a heap. Heap at the Corora sites now They'll as be going well. Straight into beta hunt, JC. Mm. Absolutely, oh. and I mean the the I was just couldn't believe the the opex savings. They're enormous. They're saving up to fifty percent of power required for um, what's involved the with the ventilation. Event. Yep. Um, I mean the kit pays for itself, and I mean in this cost inflation environment, this is a huge win for underground miners. Um, be like West Gold. Marty Law's details are in the show notes. Get onto it. If you've got an underground bolt, mine. They bolt on, don't they, GC? They bolt on to any fan. Yep, anyone. Any brand, any fan, VSD goes straight into it. Bloody brilliant. Plug and play. Nothing like a good site visit, eh? Yeah, no, I love it. Good on you, Marty. Great to, see Marty. Him at, great to see him at Diggers <laughs> too. So a uh, bit of uh, – Bit of small, the bit of gold development promise possibly coming up here. Oh, nice. This was good. Medallion and IGO. So, you know, I love seeing a bit of action for WA's uh, small cap gold community. So this, and this one's been sitting around a while waiting for a bit of a, you'd say, funding processing solution. So Medallion. Uh, they're in exclusive negotiations with IGO for a potential transaction to get a hold of the the processing plant and associated infrastructure at Forestania. So that's the spotted quoll and flying fox yep. nickel mines that IGO have. Um, and that, that'll be sort of once by the looks, once IGO finished processing all the nickel from those operations, it sounds like the, the mining's close to finished or all finished. And they're just um, processing getting rid of the rest of it. So I think it's there in a, uh, what is it, nine-month exclusive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So um, now it sounds like – it looks like the numbers are pretty bloody con- – like it sounds like they've uh, come to like an indicative arrangement, but it's not It's not binding yet. There's still DD to do and mm-hmm. to have a, like a, a full binding – Agreement. So, so what what are they paying for it all, Matty? Oh, uh, so it looks like that. This is how I interpret it. I'm pretty sure this is right. It says upfront cash of fifteen bucks, and then they assume the rehab liability, which appears is in the range of twenty five to thirty five million. And so the total consideration is capped at fifty million. So it's out, and they like they say deferred consideration, if any. So I think that means if they pay 15 cash, say then the rehab liability ends up being on the lower end at 25, there may be another 10 million of deferred consideration, but the sum of those three will not be above 50 million. So I think- Gotcha. I think I'd I'd interpret it slightly different. I think the if any just refers to given that the deal is not yet done yet, they might negotiate some deferred and- the, li- the rehab liability is just a liability going off IGO's books to, onto MMA's to, books. To medallion. But they, and, but they did – they do specifically say it will be capped at $50 million. So The total just, consideration. So they might, they yeah. might still have to definitively agree what that rehab liability is. So I would assume medallion would want it as high as possible so they don't have to pay any cash now whereas IGO would want it as low as possible so they get a bit more cash to get to that 50. Yeah. Maybe. And then How so – How would you do the deal, JD? Oh. Um, yeah, I, th- I mean, I, th- I think that consider that rehab liability is something just down the track and p- potentially there's just some corresponding they have to do with the government agency to, to confirm what the the actual liability is. Yeah. And there's something kept around that, but mm. – And your, your interpretation is – as good as as good as any with the information they've provided. We'll see what it actually looks like. Like you said, this is the exclusivity and within the next nine months, hopefully they come out with a you know, a sort of certified deal. Yeah. And so there's also a separate negotiation that's gonna go on between Medallion and IGO, but this is non exclusive. So there is potential for interlopers and that's for the actual gold and silver rights across all the Forestania tenements. So I think it looks like 
IGL will retain the nickel and the lithium rights, like for exploration or future they're projects. Doing but, a bit of exploration at the minute, I think. Yeah, yeah. So they, but they, there'll be a separate deal. So and so whether that that deal comes in, gets done with the processing deal, or that's going to be separate down the road, not sure. So there's still still a lot to um, lot to go through. So and they, Medallion also doing a cap raising alongside this for. Three and a half up to five million bucks at five cents a share. So you look at the spark chart, and it's definitely uh, Medallion's just be, it's been one of those potential developers that's been just stuck in that vortex of uh, yeah. small cap gold for the last couple of years, and just just in absolute batten down the hatches mode with preserving whatever cash they had. Um, so yeah, this is going to sort of free them up, and that that's and- that money's going towards. Bit more drilling studies, general work and cap. They do have a one million dollar exclusivity fee they've got to pay. They do have two and a half million cash already. Plus uh they've got two and a bit debt as well. I think it was two point nine. So, so Yeah. So I mean, run us through this kind of deal, because we're talking about a, a nickel plant, we're talking about a copper gold or gold copper really mm. project. I'm sure you've you've run through the numbers. What do you, oh, what? look, I had a quick look, JD. <laughs> bloody, mate, the, the intent. Just mate, on first glance. The, yeah. a, a bit of bloody, a gold development story was the thing to get me out of my woes today. Uh-huh. Out of your I mean, slumber. I'm glad it popped up. Um, so they've they've got their gold project down south in Ravensthorpe. So, you know, right right near Mount Catlin and all that. Um, the, bit, the big knock on the stock historically is – the copper contained in the gold resource, especially the the oxide component. So remember, so it's a, it's similar to a deflector. So remember, oxide gold copper is bloody hard work. So oxide close to the surface shit. So to oxide copper is when you're talking about that like that malachite and azurite. I assume that's what uh, this is on the oxide. So it can it can be floated out. It can be, but it needs like different collectors and I don't know if it's different reagents or whatever, like stuff, different different stuff compared to floating out sulfide copper. So, and when you float it out, depending on the mat, you might not get a high percentage recovery of the flotation when you're floating oxide copper, depends on the mat. So, um, yeah. You only float it if you really, really need to. I think I think that's what a lot of um, oxide ones will use, like acid leaching and, and things like that, to try and actually extract it. But when you got gold, what happens is so then if you if you don't if you try to float the oxide copper, you don't recover it all, or you recover like not a high percentage of it. Then that tail then goes through a cyanide leach circuit. You've got all the leftover oxide copper in there, which absolutely sucks up all the cyanide because it's cyanide sol- cyanide soluble, and loads up all the carbon. And you just you sort of get bugger all copper concentrate, and you get a very low recovery of gold. So the it looks like Medallion are now proposing an underground only operation. Uh, targeting just the fresh sulfide rock. So it's sort of, that'll be like a production rate of about 600,000 tonne per annum, head grade about three and a half grams per tonne gold and 0.6% copper. Um, And that subset of their resource is about 770,000 ounces of gold and 36,000 tonne of contain copper so and and how big is the the cosmic boy plant oh mate you wouldn't believe it's six hundred thousand ton per annum <laughs> what a bloody fit eh <laughs> two peas in a pod unbelievable <laughs> i think i think that number was changed to suit that number so anyway <laughs> it all works out good so getting hold of the forestania infrastructure in comparison to medallion building their own just what you were saying before jd permitting this is a fully permitted mine already and i think i think it's like i don't even think that i think because it's permitted you don't need addition for the cyanide usage but i think it's i think it's a lot easier you'd expect the timeline i think to be significantly lower if uh, compared to what if oh, they were doing it themselves essentially so much easier permitted fucking hey less surface disturbance um there's a t- there's a tfs there tsf there, tailing storage facility. Yep. Jesus, rough after diggers. Got to do a bit of a, a lift They've on that. They've got to do a lift on it, but 
a lift is easier than permitting a bloody TSF. So, yeah. and again, the surface disturbance. So, and 600,000 tonne per annum, it's probably that good fit for this underground only operation. So Mount Catlin, I'm sure, would have been thrown around right right next door, especially on the back of comments from Arcadium at AJD, but their plant's 1.8 million tonne per annum. Uh, they don't have a float circuit. It's DMS only, so probably too big. Um, and this, the... Cosmic Boy plan, it's got it's got the crushing and grinding already. It's got the flotation circuit, which they used for the nickel, obviously, that can float the sulfide copper. They will just have to had add a gravity gold circuit before the flotation circuit, and then they'll add cyanide leach tanks after the flotation circuit. So you get your gravity gold first, yep. you then float out a gold silver gold copper silver concentrate. That'll get bloody shipped out of Esperance or something. And then the tail of that float will then go through a conventional cyanide circuit. So assuming, I think they were talking about 88% or something recovery of the copper, which means that you will have a lot less copper in the tail coming out the float because you've floated most of it out. And if it's underground, you'd hope it's probably chalcopyrite or something. So you don't, it won't be that. Uh, cyanide soluble so they shouldn't have too much drama with the copper now because they're targeting the the fresh hard rock ore so yeah, deep um, stuff yeah. yeah so uh, as i said very similar to what silver lake red five do at deflector um pretty much exactly the same so i guess compared uh it, it's just so much it's so much lower barrier to entry than mm. um than building your own bloody thing but you've got to truck it 160 kilometres. You yeah. know what they say, you can't, if you can't truck, you're yeah. fucked. <laughs> but do you think, like, with the grade, um, is this really a big problem for them? I guess, like, you'd rather between the lower capex and sort of and permitting timelines and things mm. like that with the slight, you know, obviously they've got a slightly higher opex for, for trucking. I mean, that... It feels like, you know, we yet to see the numbers, but it feels like that situation is probably a net, net better outcome financially. It's just a win-win. Just a win-win. <laughs> I mean, because it looks like about uh, maybe eight, nine years mine life based on what they got. So it's not like, not a multi-decade operation. It, it's got a bit of tenure to it. Um, but fucking, yeah. So as I said, the grade's not like you truck an open pit dirt. So it's got a bit of grade sure. with the byproduct credit to it. So it's just the starting think, point, mate. I think 160 Ks from what I've been told isn't the worst number in terms of I think you can do a truck will be able to do two loads per driver. So they don't have to like it's about like the upper end of what you want to be trucking just for the in one day. For the like the fatigue management and all that. Like one driver can do two and then bloody that's it. So it's. I think once you get beyond that, it starts getting a bit difficult with the fatigue side of things. So, I think. I think this raise the three and a half to five million. It's obviously a intermediate step going towards drilling studies and working cap, and then they got to take the one million dollar exclusivity fee out of that. So, um, and they've still got two point nine of debt. But inter- it'll be interesting to see how it trades on the back of this because it's like it obviously is a potential catalyst for it, but to get the deal done for the upfront cash and whether, whether what happens with that, uh, trying to get the gold and silver rights, they're going to have to either do another capital raise, get a get a debt facility for it or some sort of script deal with IGOs. So, yeah, that, that'll be interesting to see what happens on when it comes out of halt. Interestingly, out of the three and a half million placement, one million of it has been taken up by Alkane. Oh. The New South Wales gold producer. So mm-hmm. they will now be on the register based on the pro forma market cap of being around 18 million at five cents a share. Uh, they'll be about 5.3% holder, which is, um, that's interesting, I think. What do you think the angle is um, from someone like that? Right. This, they might see this as a potential inorganic growth opportunity. Um, cause they've obviously got, got Tom and Lee ticking along, Boat of Kaiser looks like a very, a very high cap, a capital intensive project to try Slow and get there. off the ground. Yeah. This looks like probably a, you know, a little easy, easy win for them to pick up an extra, I think about gold, a gold equivalent was going to be 
eighty thousand ounces a year, something like yeah, that. That's around that. Yeah. From from the IGO perspective, it's it's really good as well, isn't it? They were talking about sort of fifteen million dollars a year having to go out just for care and maintenance. Yeah. So it's kind of great, and it's just another step in the in the road for Vela and the kind of turnaround and the rebranding and everything that they're doing at IGO. Yeah, and I think and just a it's just a bloody clean up, isn't it? Yeah. Like, mm. do you need to? Everything's getting to the end of its life. You know, it's like simplifying the business. So Get it off the books. Um, yeah. So that'd be. Um, be interesting. Good to see some bloody action. Yeah, bloody, I don't think um, I don't think this is the last time we will see. You know, in light of what's been happening in the last year or so, you know, repurposing of lithium and nickel infrastructure for other commodities, particularly gold. Yeah, we'll see if we do a see a min res and they just do a runner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, guys. Got, I, think, I, got, I think you're dealing with uh, there's some different personalities there. Slightly different. Yeah. Slightly different. <laughs> Ivan looks like a good man of his word. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> I got one more for you guys. This one's I, I find this one pretty interesting, and I just open the question up to you at the end. What you kind of think? But CZR. So why I think this is interesting is because I think this is going to be the guide on how FERB comes down on Chinese buying assets in Australia going forward. And obviously, this has been a huge point of contention for the for the last few years. And you know, it's only going in in one direction, kind of going forward. So it's a a super sort of binary outcome, what we're going to see here, because this Singaporean group, which is ultimately owned by a Chinese group, is trying to buy the Robe River asset that CZR have up in the Pilbara. It's an iron ore asset. Creasy stock, eh? Yeah. Creasy is a majority owner. FERB have asked for three one-month extensions. They've been obviously granted them. CZR want to get the deal done. It's kind of ridiculous. I don't know what they do at FERB, why, why these things take so long. But the, the market is kind of on edge. This thing trades with about a $65 million market cap at 27 cents. The bid is for roughly $102 million. That is equating to like 43 cents per share. So that that's about a 60% jump if the deal goes through. It's pretty much all hinging on FERB. Every, all the other sort of ducks are in a row. How it's going to be paid out is 80% on completion and the remaining 20 percent at the latest halfway through 2025 so that you know that's pretty pretty decent terms you're getting most of it now and the rest of it you know not too far down the track where it was trading beforehand was in and around 19 cents jumped up to almost 38 cents on the day it was or at the on the week it was announced so that was a, a doubling of the stock and then obviously since then it's it's peeled back so you kind of got the risk that Ferb asks for another extension and then asks for another and then that gets kicked down the road quite a quite a way. But, you know, this is a, a stock that could probably fall down to, to 15 cents. Who kind of knows? That's a bit below where it was trading before. Iron ores come off a bit since the, the deal was announced. You know, they're kind of in it to have someone take them out. They don't want to develop anything themselves. So obviously not great at all if it doesn't go ahead it could quite easily halve and then you've got 60% on the upside. So certainly not a bet I'm going anywhere near. But do you guys have an opinion on how you think the Aussie government is going to come down on Chinese ownership in the next few months? Well, this is, as you said, whatever happens here sets the precedent going forward. It's a yep. very, um, yeah, it's not just about one deal, is it? It's uh, about uh, every future deal that this will be used. And that's why I think it's so fascinating. Yeah. What did, what did, have you got any inkling of what you think they might do? Or you'd... I think this one's a bit nuanced. I mean, as far as, I mean, the, the deal size and uh, from as far as I'm aware, it's not like this, these assets and tenements, you know, back onto a, you know, Australian defence force base or something like that, which, um, is it a strategic asset? Probably not. I mean, those tend to be the usual considerations. Is it, you know, strategic asset? Is it, a, you know, a critical mineral for Australia? Is it, you know, a, a, a risk or threatening to be a risk uh, uh, with Australia's, you know, security interests, things like that? Um, I, I think if those, oh, no. th yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think if those things, any of them were the case, it would be an instant no. You know, if this is backing on to a, an Aussie Air Force, you know, facility, there's no way it's happening. All those things, um, like a rare earth kind of thing, we've seen how they've sort of played around with with northern minerals and those sorts of uh, interests when Chinese groups were trying to increase their ownership stake. We've seen that. 
it's kind of different. I think, yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's not strategic and that makes it a bit more of a, a vanilla kind of example, but it's a, it's a super hard one. Because we see um, whose verb decision was a bit delayed? Was it the um, – Azua. Azua. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, look, that wasn't delayed as, as much as this one, but um, just because it's – you know, we're dealing with a, a government group here, you know, just because it's delayed doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, it's a bit different. It's notoriously to, slow. Yeah, I think it's a bit different to, I think it was something about when the Chinese telecommunications company and I think it was Wyoming did all these, uh, got all these, did all these contracts for real cheap, which uh, coincidentally were in close proximity to some of the nuclear launch sites within America. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're not dealing with that sort of stuff. Yeah. We're yeah. pretty... Australia's pretty crazy. They just want to mine a bit of iron ore. <laughs> hey, just Creasy's just trying to chuck a bit of food on the table. That's it. Trying right. to send the kids to private school. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> oh, give the bloody, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that'd be uh, good stuff, JD. That'd be very, very Fun interesting. To watch. Oh, mate, the stuff I watch because JD tells me to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's bloody unreal. Oh, what a bloody, ah, uh, we got through, eh? Hey? As long yeah. as you're around, good people, she's all good. That's it. Chin up, guys. Good Talking work. stocks. <laughs> All righty. Right, you know, did a great job. Gee, oh, who, JD? Access Mining Technology. Jeez, they did. And they always do a great job. Oh, they do. Bloody, especially on the blower. Give them a buzz. Who else we got, mate? Mineral Mining Services, MMS. Get onto them. Also got Verify. Great to catch up with them in Cow. Smec, DSI Underground, Silverstone, CRE Insurance, Greenlands Equipment, K Drill. And whilst you're at it, you spark. Get a spark in ya. Uderoo, yeah. money miners. Uderoo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.